Uh, my name is Mark Lorenz. I'm an ear, nose, and throat physician. I finished my fellowship at the House Clinic about three years ago, and then I moved up to Anchorage, Alaska, and work at the Alaska Native Medical Center. Um, soon after I moved there, I realized I'm is very busy for ear problems. I think I'm, I'm probably one of the busiest ear guys in the United States just by virtue of working there. Uh, just to put it in perspective, last week, I was in the OR every day last week. I had four cholesteatoma cases, three canal wall downs, two osteoplasties, six tympanoplasties, and um, an encephalocele repair, not mine. Um, anyway, this is uh, Denali National Park. It's very beautiful. It's the largest park in the United States. It's uh, larger than the state of Massachusetts. Um, I took this last summer. Every other picture in my presentation is just from the last couple months. But we have uh, beautiful scenery, but terrible ears. I don't have any disclosures. Um, other than ear problems, we also have a lot of facial trauma. This is kind of an interesting story. This is a, what I was doing on Super Bowl Sunday. Um, this man was watching the game in Shivak, which is a tiny village in Alaska, and his brother hit him in the face with a frying pan. He broke his face in many sites, and um, that was the first quarter of the game. Uh, his brother was a Seahawks fan. He came in in a Tom Brady jersey, believe it or not. It was unbelievable. Um, but anyway, I had to put 13 plates in his face just to fix it. Um, but that's what I was doing on the Super Bowl. Uh, so there's a couple couple things that, uh, a couple specific challenges in dealing with our patients. The first and most obvious is uh, geographical. Uh, we have a population that we serve, it's about 200,000 people. The vast majority of them live outside the Anchorage area. Um, because of where they live, uh, many of them don't have access to running water uh, because the ground is permanently frozen, so there's no water that runs under the ground. Uh, most of them don't live within 500 miles of an MD, um, so it kind of puts in perspective. When you see somebody with a cerumen impaction and the most educated person in the town is a high school educated person, uh, how do you manage that person? Uh, there's also some social and cultural issues that make it a more challenging population than typical to deal with. Uh, there are 229 um, different tribes in Alaska. And there's four major languages that are spoken. Um, most, most have a background, at least that know some English, but we have to keep that in mind when we see a lot of our elderly patients. Um, many of our patients live in modified shipping containers. Um, it's a really popular, popular type of home to have just because it's, it's easily portable. It also means they have poor home ventilation. Um, there's still lots of tobacco use in our population, so you can imagine somebody smoking in a shipping container uh, probably is bad for their children's ears. Um, because there's no running water in a lot of Alaska, uh, hygiene can frequently be just limited to steam baths. And I think because of that, we also have an MRSA is endemic in our population. So most of my failures after ear surgery have been secondary to MRSA infections. Um, I cited this study here at the bottom saying that there's a threefold incidence in chronic ear disease when compared to the general US population. This, this is a pretty unscientific talk. There's actually not a lot of research on the Alaska Native population. This is one of the few, few uh, things that's actually evidence-based. There was a study in the American Journal of Pediatrics in 2002 which studied Native Americans and uh, Alaska Natives and the frequency of ear infections in children under one. What they found was that Alaska Natives are about three times as, as likely as non-Native patients to have an ear infection less than one. Um, I have to admit, I think that I have a number of Native American patients, and uh, I would say that their ears are seem to be in much better shape than the Alaska Native patients. So I'd, I'd be curious to tease out what the actual um, incidence of tympanoplasty is in our population. But it's pretty uncommon that you'll meet an adult. Well, I shouldn't say uncommon. I'd say at least 50 or 60 percent of adult patients you see have had a tympanoplasty at some point. Um, to put it in perspective of where these patients live, this is a, a photograph of Little Diomede Island. Um, I had to bring a patient in from Little Diomede a couple months ago. It was a nine-month-old that had a big neck abscess. Um, it's a, got a population of about 135 people. It's only two and a half miles from Russia. And to bring this little kid in to Anchorage required a helicopter flight to Nome, followed by a 530-mile flight to Anchorage after that. Uh, it's actually easier to access Little Diomede in the wintertime because the ocean's frozen and they make a landing strip 
next to their, their village. Um, but pretty much from every home in Little Diomede, you can see Russia. Um, there's not too many other places in Alaska you can do that. Uh, this is just a map that shows how big Alaska is. We work uh, in this area right here. That's where Anchorage is. So you can imagine um, if you have a post-op patient that just has a little piece of retained gel foam and they're up in Barrow, it's the, the equivalent of bringing somebody from northern Minnesota down to Iowa just to have their ear cleaned. So it, it kind of does affect most of our decisions when managing ear problems. If someone's got um, cerumen and they're out in, on St. Paul Island, it's like bringing them from Wyoming to Iowa just to have cerumen taken out. So it definitely influences how we manage these people. I included this map just because it's one of the few that actually has little diamede on it. Um, it's way up here. So that's little diamede. And then I've seen patients from all the way out here. Little diamede. They come, they come from everywhere. And they all have ear problems, terrible ear problems. I, I use cerumen as an example, but really it's usually a lot worse than that. Um, there are some anatomic factors that also are very specific to Alaska Natives. This has not been studied or written up anywhere, but I'll tell you, just as somebody who saw lots of problems in Los Angeles, I've, I've been on medical missions for ear surgery, lots of places in Nepal, pretty much everywhere, and um, there are very specific things to Native Alaskan ears. Specifically, they have a really big tympanosquamous suture. Um, because of that, I find I need to do a, a canalplasty probably in about 60 to 70% of all the tympanoplasties I do. They have an unusually deep oval window. I, I don't know how to explain it other than doing a stapedectomy on an Alaska native. You have to be ready to, to, to not see very well because um, sometimes the oval window niche is about two or three millimeters below um, where the, the level of the facial nerve is. Uh, it's shockingly deep sometimes. So pulling a cholesteatoma out of a deep oval window um, makes you a little bit nervous sometimes. They have poorly pneumatized mastoids, which is, which is a bad thing. And also, it's not such a bad thing, because if you're doing lots of canal wall downs, it means they have small cavities for cleaning. And then to top it all off, they're also keloid formers. Uh, when, we do have a couple things going for us, though, when we manage ear problems. And I think that probably the, one of the few things, the things that you can draw from this presentation are if you see patients that don't live in town that you're managing, I think we, we have some algorithms worked out that work pretty well for us. So if you're dealing with patients that, are, again, they're traveling a long distance to see you and you're, you're doing ear surgery, um, I hope that maybe you can use some of our patterns and apply them to your practice. Some of the good things that we have, though, are uh, finances are, are pretty good for our patients. Um, up on the top left of the screen, that's actually the hospital in Barrow. It's a $200 million facility that opened last year. Barrow has about 2,000 people that live there. Um, and they, it's an eight-bed inpatient facility. Um, and they have uh, sculptures and fireplaces and fine art everywhere. It is uh, unbelievably nice. And the reason they can afford all that is that the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation is, the, is a corporation that bought the hospital. It posted a profit of $4 billion last year, and it's owned by 2,000 natives in that area. Um, they're basically the ones that are leasing land out to ConocoPhillips or BP for drilling rights. And so they do very well. It's the 183rd largest corporation in the United States, this little, little um, corporation of natives that live in the top of Alaska. It's bigger than J. Crew, um, just by one, but it's still pretty big. And not to be outdone, the one below it is the hospital in Nome. It's also a $200 million hospital. Um, big industry in the Norton Sound area is fishing or mining. Um, they're very well to do. And then this is our hospital at the bottom left. Um, that's the Alaska Native Medical Center. We have an operating budget between about three and $400 million a year. Um, it's very pretty. Uh, but we do all our surgeries in Anchorage, and so we fly patients down to Anchorage for it, mostly because they don't have anesthesiologists at some of the other facilities. Uh, the other thing that we really have going for us is we have great telemedicine access. We have pretty much a world-class system. So every little village, uh, whether or not it's got a population of 40 or a population of 4,000, has a telemedicine cart, which is basically like an email system. 
and the ability to take otoscopic pictures, um, which is great. And it's, it's usually run by, by people that are village health aides is, is the title they have. They typically have a, a high school education, um, but what they do is they identify kids that have draining ears. They'll take a picture of their ear and email us, but what do we do? And this is a telemedicine just from last week. It's kind of hard to see real well, but you see a lot of pus draining out of a perforation in a little nine-month-old's ear. So, you know, you put this kid on antibiotics and you can just message them that, and it saves them having to fly into Anchorage just for that kind of treatment. Um, this was another one we got just recently. This is a, a little girl that I put tubes in over a year ago, having left ear pain. Um, you can see the tube is out. She's got otitis media. And so, again, the telemedicine system is the only thing that really makes our practice possible. I, I included this one just because you almost never see it this well. Um, this wasn't too recently, but this is an um, adult who developed ear pain and hearing loss after an, after an upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, you almost never see it this clearly, but this is bolus meningitis. Um, this person was on an island out in the middle of nowhere, so bringing them in just to, for diagnostic purposes is pretty rough. I mean, I guess if they were in Anchorage, I would pop that bola and uh, put them on eardrops. But given how far they were, we put them on oral antibiotics and eardrops, and they got better. And this is our classic uh, telemedicine consult. This is a uh, seven-year-old and um, came to me for this large perforation. And this is a picture I took one day preoperatively. And uh, you can see that the, the patient has a foreshortened malleus. Um, you're looking at the middle ear. It's discharging a little bit. There's some pus around the rim of it. Um, if the person lived locally, if they were an Anchorage patient and the ear is infected, yeah, you can put them on some ear drops and oral antibiotics and de delay surgery until they're not as infected. And this one's actually not, not that infected. Um, but given how far people travel to see us, and some of them, again, they come via helicopter ride to airports to take a flight into Anchorage, you know, we push through. Um, and so we're, we're operating on a lot of infected ears. Uh, I think at least 30 or 40% of our ears are draining at the time of surgery. Um, it used to be, I used to think that, you know, it's, it's not ideal to fix an ear when it's infected that you, know, you would want to delay things as long as possible, try to get it healthy and dry before operating. You know, I, I've been working here long enough and tell you that I've not noticed any difference between a draining ear and operating on it and a healthy ear and operating on it. I, I, the one things that I modify are that I, I do a mastoidectomy on an ear like this. Um, I would add that in if it was draining. I rinse it all out with bacitracin containing solution or iodine and f just load it up with antibiotics and again, Surprisingly, it still managed to heal most of the time. So uh, we have a rough algorithm for how we manage these telemedicine consults. I have eight partners, and we all do lots of ear surgery. Um, basically, six years old is, a, is sort of a magic number for us. There's some evidence to suggest that when you do a tympanoplasty under six, um, there's a slightly reduced healing rate mostly because they have a higher incidence of getting an upper respiratory tract infection and otitis media right after your surgery and it falling apart. If you can, I think it's ideal to wait until they're a little bit older than six. Um, if they're older than six, then we go ahead and do a tympanoplasty on that exact type of ear if they have any type of hearing loss or drainage. Um, if they're under than six, yet less than six, generally we'll, we'll tell them that they should wick their ears out at home use uh, wadded up tissue paper to, to pull the pus out, that they keep dry ear precautions, that they use lots of ototopicals. And if they have a lot of hearing loss and it's a dry ear, then we give them hearing aids. If they're older than six, again, then we're going to the operating room. And like I said, if, if they show up on the day pre-op, and usually I'm meeting, meeting most of my patients one day preoperatively, if, they're having, if they have a draining ear, I just add a mastoidectomy into the ear surgery. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it, it does help clean out all that pus and inflammation that's in the mastoid, which I think is more part of the reason that we're, we're pretty successful with training ears. Uh, I do lots of cartilage tympanoplasties, um, and you'll see some examples of ad adhesive otitis media or patients that had large failures a long time ago. And um, I think a cartilage tympanoplasty, just like Dr. Mal Malinsky was saying, has a, a slightly higher incidence of healing, especially in these really problem ears. So hopefully, um, 
if you do a lot of ear surgery, I would just encourage you to keep that in your armamentarium that, you know, just think that you shouldn't just keep doing fascial tympanoplasties if it keeps failing. Think about doing a cartilage tympanoplasty. And then finally, uh, if I have a tiny little failure, like a little tiny perforation after a tympanoplasty, I do lots of fat moringoplasties, just plugging it with a little piece of fat, and they can fly home the next day. I've had really good success with that. This is your average six-year-old. Um, it's not a great looking ear. They have a large central perforation. And even at six, you're seeing big sheets of moringa sclerosis. That's something else we see that's, I, I've seen worse tympano and moringa sclerosis in our population than I've ever seen in my life. I've seen it filling the mastoid cavity up against the epitympanum, in the, touching the ossicles. You have to pick it out. It's like a soft white moringa sclerosis. Um, I, I generally remove all the moringa sclerosis with every tympanoplasty just because I think it heals better and I think it hears better. Uh, this one, you know, if you didn't have a set pattern for how you're managing large perforations might give you some pause. It's a three-year-old that's got a very severe speech delay and a moderate, mild to moderate conductive loss. In my mind, it's pretty clear I'd put hearing aids on this kid and wait until they're a little bit older, just again, because I think there's a better chance for it healing without getting an effusion right away. And um, an older child is a little bit more mature and able to handle ear cleaning postoperatively. So this one, I'd put hearing aids on her, and uh, if she couldn't keep the aids in or if it caused more drainage, then I'd have a low threshold to fix at least one ear. But when you're three and you have a profound speech delay and you're not using any words, I think it's better to amplify right away. Uh, this is data that I collected over about two years. Um, so I did close to almost 300 tympanoplasties. Uh, more than half of them were pediatric. Uh, about half of them were revisions. Six of them were cholesteatoma cases. We have a very large incidence of patients not following up anymore, partly because it's hard to access. Um, I mean, they, I'm not usually bringing these patients back to Anchorage for a checkup, but um, if they come back, you know, they actually have to have a working cell phone or address that we can contact them to bring them back. That is frequently not the case. So um, I probably, you'll probably never see this data published because I have a very high no-show rate. But I'd like to think it's because they're back in their villages um, and they're happy with their ears and don't think anything more is needed to be done, but it's probably not true for everybody. I have had some failures. Uh, I don't have too many failures uh, that I know of, but um, the few that I've had that needed another intervention just because of hearing loss or they were still getting occasional drainage, um, most of them under, well, about half of them decided to, to go through with just a fat moringoplasty, and every one but a single patient has, has healed up from that. So that one person is pretty sour, but everybody else is pretty happy. Um, here's an example. I've got a couple pearls that I, if you don't do lots of can, canal plasties, um, I suggest practicing these in the temporal bone lab tomorrow. Uh, this is drilling away the tympanosquamous suture line. Um, just for, for better visualization, I think if you have an anterior perforation, you should basically be doing an, a canal plasty. You don't want it to fail because you didn't do a canal plasty. A canal plasty, when you get good at it, takes maybe five or ten minutes. The, re the biggest thing is waiting for the, them to plug in the drill and pull the bits. But um, if you're ready and you have them, uh, have the equipment handy, it's a quick and easy way to improve your success rate. Also, take big pieces of fascia. I take very big, very thick pieces of fascia. This is actually uh, Dr. John Kokesh who's back there. He, he harvested this piece of fascia. He's like me, though. He takes big pieces. I learned that from Brackman at House. He takes massive pieces. He takes the whole thing. And it's usually a half-dollar size piece that he takes out. He doesn't save anything for revision. He just makes sure that he gets a nice, big, healthy piece of fascia. And there's a little notch in this one for wrapping around the malleus handle. Um, if you want to read about the actual technique of tympanoplasty, I typically use something similar to what Glasscock describes for his undersurface approaches, um, where he'll make a little anterior flap using the superior canal wall skin, drape it around the malleus, support it using multiple pieces of gel foam, put the skin back, and fill the ear canal with bacitracin. This is a little kid that came to me with a marginal perforation. Um, this was the telemedicine. When they came in, they had a large amount of of draining debris from the perforation. Uh, this is one that needed a, a mastoidectomy just to clear it out and make sure there's no squamous debris. 
So again, adding a mastoidectomy is not that big a deal. Once you do enough of them, it adds maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And basically, when, for a situation like that, you just want to make sure the antrum's wide open and that you can get free flow of fluid between the mastoid and middle ear. This is a, a guy I fixed up last week. He had um, pretty bad adhesive otitis media. Um, this is one that, in my mind, uh, immediately think of cartilage tympanoplasty. So, so use a Dornhofer technique. This is not the same patient, but this is sort of what it looks like. You, I use a Dornhofer cartilage tympanoplasty, meaning you take a big piece of cartilage and you cut down the middle of it and put the malleus in the middle of it. And so it's like a big circle with a, a line cut out the center for the malleus. You would think that this is an ear that doesn't hear well. This ear has thresholds at 15 decibels. Um, so just like Dr. Malinsky said, I don't think it has a lot to do with the eardrum, how, how well people heal. You can have a very thick eardrum and hear fine. Um, these are people that did not get cartilage tympanoplasties. Um, this is somebody that obviously had a big attic retraction and failed after a graft. This is not my patient. It was a long time ago, but it's a pretty hideous looking cholesteatoma. Um, and I see that all the time. This is another guy that had had surgery somewhere in Oklahoma, and he moved up to Alaska, and um, large, large cholesteatoma. There's no question about what to do with this in my mind. He needs cartilage. But he actually, this one's getting staged because he's got a big cholesteatoma. But in his second stage procedure, I plan on putting cartilage underneath a, a porp because he has a functioning stapes. Uh, speaking of pearls, this is the kind of problem you can see if you do enough tympanoplasty. This is an epithelial pearl. In our patient population, it's a big deal if you've got to catch two flights just to come to the clinic and have a pearl opened up. So um, I've become a lot more careful with putting my flaps back. Um, this is just something you can take care of in, in the clinic by numbing the ear canal with a little injection, lancing it, and sucking it out. I've had a couple canal fibroses. Also, not that big a deal. You can numb it, inject it in the clinic, and just core it out in the clinic. And surprisingly, it's, you know, if you are able to flap the skin down, it still doesn't reaccumulate, at least not the three or four that I've had. And then this is when I, was, when I first moved up to Alaska. I was doing lots of the house technique tympanoplasty, which involves lots of lateral grafts. I have definitely moved away with that from that. Uh, a couple of things I don't talk about in terms of lateral graft tympanoplasty is the length of time it takes to heal. It takes a lot longer to heal than from an undersurface graft. You have a much higher incidence of granular meningitis. And if you're somebody who's 1,700 miles away, um, treating granular meningitis is not so easy. You can't put boric acid on that. You can't paint it with gentian violet. So my preference is an undersurface graft. But I still, you know, for, I think for total perforations or really far anterior recurrent perforations, I'm probably still doing at least 15 or 20% of my cases as lateral graft. This is an example of a keloid. Uh, I've never really seen that many keloids behind the ear until I moved up here. This is, these are kind of tough to fix because you don't have a lot of skin laxity back there. And no matter how you excise it and close it, you still are always under a little bit of tension. Um, this is an example of somebody that had a misleading telemedicine. So this was like a tiny, looks like a tiny cholesteatoma. The other side looked way worse. And then bring him into Anchorage and scanned him. And then he had a massive cholesteatoma in this right ear that eroded all of the middle, or the, the tegmin mastoidium, and the, um, I had to fix that with a cartilage graft so it wouldn't be left with a massive encephalocele. This was an interesting one. This is a lady that had had surgery on her ear over 40 years ago. Uh, she was very dizzy. She lived out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, whenever she put her hearing aid in, she felt dizzy. She had this huge keratin horn growing off the stapes, and uh, every time I touched it, she got very, very dizzy. Imaging shows that it actually went through the oval window and dilated the vestibule a little bit. Um, I think I'm pretty bold. <laughs> I just went ahead and popped it out and, and grafted it, and she did fine. She's very happy. Um, but I was thinking in my mind I might be doing cochlear implant on her other ear if uh, it didn't work. Um, can anyone tell what's happening in this photo? Um, I took that image on the top left with a flexible laryngoscope, and um, this is a guy that's never had ear surgery, and I guess I'll just run, I don't have a ton of time, but I'll just tell you. Um, he has a large mastoid canal fistula. I see those all the time, and if it's large, you just do a canal wall down mastoidectomy. I think most people 
try not to do a canal reconstruction unless it's less than about a centimeter size defect. This one was about three centimeters. I'm going to take his canal wall down next week. Um, but you can see it's also bilateral. So I don't know if you would call that canal cholesteatomas or really bad keratosis obturans. The part I left out was I pulled a massive skin plug from this left ear uh, just in order to be, to be able to see that. But he's got a draining ear. It's uncomfortable for him. So we're just going to fix him up next week. This is an interesting one. This is a young guy who came to see me with neck pain, uh, and they had been treating him for muscle spasms in his neck, and specifically the left side of his neck. It was pretty focal. He pointed around the SCM. And what you can see on this, and this is a guy that's never had surgery, and I'm not sure how I can explain it, but he got a massive cholesteatoma in his mastoid that extended down the jugular bulb into the neck. And, um, you know, again, what, there's only a few few surgeries that we have. So I just took his canal wall down and grafted over it. Uh, I left the jugular bulb area open, but it was pretty intense trying to get the skin out of the neck around that. And then um, gave him a, a gigantic meatoplasty. So anytime the wind blows out in Nome, he, he feels like he's going to fall over. He said he's, his biggest complaint is when he's on a snow machine and moving quickly, he gets a little dizzy. I just told him to put an earplug in. I don't think I can do any better. Um, and so, just to review some of the personal strategies, and again, I know this is not a real scientific presentation, but again, if you work on patients who live a distance away, I think this kind of helps. Think about tympanoplasty when children are older than six. Try to do undersurface grafting if you don't have easy access to your patients. I remove all the moringosclerosis. I use only dissolvable packing, and my typical packing is a couple pieces of gel foam lateral to hold the, the drum down. And then I fill the ear canal with bacitracin, um, just because, again, if they're back home and they've got a little retained gel foam, it's kind of a big deal bringing them back just to take that out. I do lots of cartilage tympanoplasties, and I have a very low threshold for canal wall down surgery. Um, I, give, I give my patients a bottle of eardrops to go home because it can take a couple of weeks to get your shipment of phloxin out to little diamine. And then I, I always get at least a couple of follow-up appointments, at least I try, um, just because your early success is not always your long-term success, uh, especially if they jump back on several flights right after your ear surgery, they can, they can pop their ear before they get home. Um, this is one of the nurses that works with us. Her name's Ra Raquel. Uh, maybe she looks familiar. She was in the World Series of Poker um, a couple months ago, and that's not her poker face. I, I saw her poker face when I asked for a laser the other day, and it wasn't draped, and they didn't have the filter on the scope, but she's very nice. Um, I include this picture. This is my wife and daughter. When we moved up here, we thought we'd see gold everywhere. So this is us panning for gold out in Crow Creek Mine. We found nothing. That gold on the far right is actually stuff I found last October when a retaining wall fell in my driveway. And I had, I, I power washed the dirt off my driveway and I saw gold covering the asphalt. So I swept it up into a pan. And my wife knows that when the, when the ice melts in our yard, she's going to see a bunch of potholes in the front yard for me taking test pans. But um, that's going to be basically in about two weeks, I'm going to dig up the yard. <laughs> but anyway, then that's not even from very much dirt. It was unbelievable. Um, anyway, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you guys work tomorrow.